Hello, and welcome to our celebration of my mom's life. A life filled with friends, laughter, generosity, dancing, and love that was cut far too short. We thank friends and family from the Pullman community and from afar for joining us today to share in grief but also in celebration. We hope that today will be an opportunity to recognize my mom's many professional and personal accomplishments I shared by people who she encountered at different points along her journey. Today we cry for the loss of a wife, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a friend, a colleague, a mentor, and my mother. And we welcome and we come together to comfort one another during this difficult time, but we also smile and give thanks for having such an incredible woman in our lives. And we laugh because Rosie Lodges is here. <laughs> organizations. 
She was a champion, as we all know, for equity and fairness, and she brought that to not only um, her job, but her life. And she was truly one of our WSU's um, points of light. In a single year, it truly is amazing what this woman did in a single year. Um, it's a tremendous legacy, and our challenge is to continue the myriad of programs that she started and executed over this past year. Um, she quickly became a great resource for faculty that were struggling to navigate academic life. And her motivation really was simple, and we all know this of Kelly, and that was simply to improve the quality of life for the most important resource of a university, that being its people. And Kelly, and I know Leanne, the next speaker will speak directly to this, will most likely re be remembered here most as a champion of the women faculty. Throughout her career, she fought to elevate the status of women throughout the academy and at WSU, and she worked tirelessly to better incorporate the complexity of women's lives and careers <clears throat> into our policies and practices. And finally, we will all remember at WSU, Kelly for her caring and compassion. You know, no matter how busy she was, and you, we all know that she was very busy, um, you know, she uh, was truly kind of the energizer bunny in the office. Um, no matter how busy, she took the time to address people's needs and recognize their accomplishments. You know, she had her cool little gifts, and it's really appropriate that we have little keychains here because many of us have little gifts that Kelly gave us that are pretty meaningful to us. Um, you know, we remember her notes. We remember her homemade goodies that came out of her kitchen. Um, um, we remember her talks, and we certainly remember her walks. All of the little things that demonstrate how much she cared. And finally, to the family, thank you for sharing your wife and your mother with us for these 15 years. <clears throat> the thoughts and prayers of, our, of the entire Cougar Nation, and it is a powerful group, are always with you. And I think we can all agree here that despite all the professional accomplishments we're going to hear about, and all that I talked about, the truly her lasting and greatest legacy is sitting in the front row here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Leanne Hunter. In some ways, I'm the least likely person to be standing up in front of you today. I've only known Kelly for one year, but it was, and you'll see what an impactful year that was. Um, I'm here also representing faculty women at WSU, and that's somewhat unlikely too because I'm non tenure track faculty member, um, which means I'm a temporary faculty member. Um, but you'll see also how I've benefited from her mentorship in one year. It all started when she called me a rock star. <laughs> That's what the subject line said after Kelly attended my workshop last uh, a year ago at the Women's Leadership Conference. Here's some of what she wrote. Dear Leanne, I loved every single thing about your session yesterday. Truly amazing. I especially loved when you ran to us. I can still hear Virginia, you, reading in my ears. Thank you as well for sharing your story as a way for us to create and recreate ours. You're an inspiration and an amazing teacher, Kelly. And this was very normal for her to send us these kinds of, of notes. This is very common. So many women have shared similar notes since. And what a gift for me to receive this note from someone whose work I admire. This was one short note, one small gift, one tiny seed that Kelly planted inside me. But as one of our faculty members said recently, Kelly knew that small things were big things. Kelly made me feel seen and valued and honored. 
I wouldn't have fully believed her if she hadn't kept coming back to me again and again with follow-up emails. Truly amazing. You are a star. Kelly embodied a practice of mentoring that consisted of slowly and persistently teaching us to believe in ourselves. In one short year, Kelly was a force of nature that stepped into my life and steadily transformed it. And our bond was rapidly tightening. During my last walk with Kelly, we seamlessly weaved back and forth between themes in our personal lives and themes in our profession. I shared deep, personal truths with her that I never would have revealed within the walls of a campus building or even a coffee shop. We were both unbounded by the sky above us as we both translated these personal truths into a vision for the future of higher education. Kelly was famous for her walks because they perfectly capture what Kelly stood for, connecting with people on all levels, balancing work with life, and walking side by side with her colleagues, removing any barriers of status or hierarchy from the relationship. And with her fullest of hearts, she walked by our sides, clearing a path for us, blazing her light on us, because Kelly knew that we could change the world. My last walk with Kelly was also my first one. And yet, you can begin to sense the magnitude of influence she had on my life, and how I will carry on in her path, in her walk, in her light, to honor future generations of women after me. If Kelly made this kind of difference in my life, imagine all the women that Kelly has come into contact with over time. Kelly knew that small things were big things. She planted life in us so that we could plant life in others. Kelly's last year as vice provost was also her first year. It's amazing what she can accomplish in a single year. And as she stepped into this position as Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Recognition, she knew that it wasn't enough to, to clear the path for us one by one. She needed to build a scaffold of new systems of support that could hold up more women than she could ever possibly reach individually, but she would certainly try to reach them. And she was eminently capable of creating substantial institutional change that would benefit every single member of the university system. In her letter of application for the position, Kelly wrote, without a healthy faculty that has support structures in place, it is not possible for WSU to carry out strategic initiatives like the Drive to 25 and the Grand Challenges. As we honor Kelly's legacy, the Association for Faculty Women will collaborate with the President's Commission on the Status of Women and the Office of the Provost to build an infrastructure for women to continue to grow and thrive at WSU in Kelly's name. We will focus on mentoring in the Kelly Ward way with colleagues walking alongside one another on shared pathways. And to honor her commitment to tangible systemic change, we propose a walking path that weaves Kelly's legacy into the fabric of the WSU campus to create a space in the bright light and open air where we can congregate, collaborate, and extend our own branches far up into the sky where there can be no glass ceiling to stop us. Just the one.
Um, I want to thank Daisy and Jean and Lucy and Henry for providing me this opportunity to say something today and to thank you for sharing Kelly with me. So all of us who come together from all of these different realms of Kelly's existence. They're her childhood friends, her family, horse friends, her children's friends, all of these different lives. And the, we each bring a different angle to our understanding of Kelly. Of course, there's things that we all share together, and you'll see that in our stories. Um, but I felt like I uh, wanted to be able to tell you a little bit about Kelly's academic side without going through her CV and telling you about all of those accomplishments. Um, I also want to say that I feel like I know all of you, um, although we might never have met in person, because if you knew Kelly, then you knew she probably told me a story about you and some <laughs> other, and I assume vice versa. So my goal here is to make sure that you get to know a little bit about the Kelly that I knew, the academic mother who wanted to advance in her career to further our understanding of higher education and to make places like WSU and other universities better places to be a student, a staff member, or a faculty member. So let's start at the beginning, and I won't walk you through everything, but Kelly and I met at an academic conference, ASH, in 1990. We were both graduate students, and we were attending a graduate policy seminar. We looked at each other across the room, and it was love at first sight. <laughs> We, she identified me as the other fun person in the room, <laughs> and we bonded instantly. Our, initially, our friendship just started as going out for dinner twice a year at conferences, and then eventually it grew from there, with the lots of walks in between. <clears throat> but we only got to see each other twice a year, at least in those early days. Our relationship grew as we added on to our responsibilities. We earned our doctorates, we got our first academic jobs, we got married, we had babies, and we lived all of those experiences in tandem together. At some point or other, we decided that it would be great if we could find some topic that we could study together, some research project that we might do. And our initial project actually was about service learning and it tied to Kelly's work at, uh, in Montana and my dissertation work, and we wrote an article together, and that worked really well. And our relationship grew from being friends to being lifetime collaborators. The Academic Motherhood Project uh, began after a session that we attended uh, together at a conference, Babies in Tow, where the key message of the panel was that it was impossible to be a successful academic and have a family at the same time. I remember us walking out of that session, and I'm not sure who said it or what exact, how it exactly transpired, but we looked at each other, holding our babies, thinking about how fantastic our lives were, and said, perhaps they're asking the wrong questions. And clearly, they're not telling our story. So, thus the project began. We identified 120 women in different institutional types, in different fields, and we identified them uh, uh, as people to interview. And instead of saying, tell us how hard it is, tell us all the ways it's impossible, we decided to ask, how do you make it work? I should tell you over the years, and this project has been going on, we're in our third iteration, um, our collaborative style is not for everyone. <laughs> Kelly and I, our favorite collaborative style is either to sit in person, that's our preference, or on the phone, <clears throat> and to have one of us type and both of us talk. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the clickety clickety click of the, uh, of the typewriter. We took turns, who was the typist, who was the talker. Uh, sometimes in the early days, we did that while also expressing milk and using breast pumps. <laughs> so the click of the keyboard, you have that sound, and then the sucking noise of the breast pump. <laughs> <laughs> on on the speakerphone, we were in, our doors closed. Uh, but it worked for us. We were able to be quite 
productive and able to get a, a lot of work done that way, we are forever and will be forever indebted to Jean, who edited our text, <laughs> because both Kelly and I were slightly wordy. <laughs> Even to this day, when we have tasks to do that aren't collaborative, we do it, we get work done by calling, setting us appointment, calling each other, and then working on our own tasks in tandem. Again, no more, no more sound to press up, a click of the, of the keyboard with occasional stops to talk or ask a question. We call it productive parallel play, which is what we would write on our calendars. <laughs> so everyone knows that Kelly liked to have fun, and we share that too. We love to shop and to walk, let's talk and to walk and to shop. We both wear bright colors. I bought this dress today. Uh, we wear fun jewelry. And when we won a joint award at our association last year, we went on an epic journey to try and find matching dresses. <laughs> <laughs> because who doesn't want us to receive a big national award with your favorite colleague wearing a matching outfit? <laughs> We wanted people, we did it for us, but we also did it purposely because we wanted other people, particularly junior people, to see that it was possible to have fun and have be a serious academic, that it wasn't an either or choice. And I want you to know that Kelly had a serious side. She was ambitious. She loved research. She loved ideas. She loved working on projects. Sometimes when we got behind on a project and we work on it a little bit, she said, I forgot how great this project was. We should be doing this more often. Uh, she got upset when people didn't take her seriously. When they looked at her and thought, oh, she's just wearing pretty dresses and having fun earrings and fun scars. She wanted people to take her seriously. She wanted people to recognize that as I said, you can be a serious academic and have a life outside of it. If you were her student, you know that she expected a lot out of you. She demanded it. She probably made you cry. <laughs> you also know that she thought you were a rock star. And she believed in you and she supported you, all the while expecting the most of you. If you were her colleague, she would want you to have work hard, but she'd also want you to live a good life. If you were her friend, she likely pushed you as well. She likely asked you some question like, what's next? Or what's your plan? Or some other insightful question that you knew was a prompt for you to keep going or to do better but also to love yourself and appreciate yourself and be comfortable in your own skin. If you read her work, then you know that the content of her work reflected the way that she lived her life. Her focus on women, on mentoring, on work-life balance were not just topics she wrote about. They were Kelly. She walked that walk. She navigated the academy in the way that she believed it could be, even if it wasn't always ready for her. I know that the, but she, the work she was doing here at WSU in her new position and throughout her 15 years here was designed to help make this place a better place, a place where life and work balance was a viable option. And I'm thrilled by the end talk to know that that will continue. 88 exclamation point. That was the tagline on the last email that I got from Kelly. We had completed 88 interviews for the third round of our motherhood study. She added, the trip was amazing. Daisy is thriving. We have to talk on Thursday, how about 11? We have to finish the Baldwin project we have to write the AERA proposal. We have to figure out our next steps. She concluded the email as she always did. Love you, mean it, XXOO. 
going to read a really quick poem for you. I'm Jewish, and part of the grieving process is about remembering people and having them live on after they're gone. So this is a poem that is said after, uh, in the Jewish ceremony, after you recite the mortar Scottish, and I'm not reciting anything in Hebrew now, so. <laughs> so this is in English. At the rising sun and then it's going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. At the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. At the bluest, blueness of the sky and the warmth of the summer, we remember them. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of the autumn, we remember them. At the beginning of the year, <clears throat> And when it ends, we remember them. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have decisions that are difficult to make, we remember them. When we have joy we crave to share, we remember them. When we have achievements that are based on theirs, we remember them. For as long as we live, they too will live. For they are now a part of us. We remember them. As Kelly would say, hello, my loves. <laughs> my name is Deb Desjardins, and I'm a friend of Kelly's from our time in Oklahoma. I first want to say that for me, it is not possible to speak of Kelly without also speaking of Jean. I think all of us have an idea of the very special bonds they share. The Kelly I knew was who she was in large part due to Jean. And the love and faith he brought. I will never forget the day we met. <laughs> it was August 1999 in Stillwater. My husband Mike and I had just moved there, as had Kelly and Jean. Daisy was a toddler. Lucy was a few months old. We met them at the School of Education family picnic. I had been apprehensive about moving to Oklahoma. <laughs> No offense to any Oklahomans here. <laughs> but when we met Kelly and Jean, I thought to myself, it's going to be okay. <laughs> At the end of the picnic, Kelly said to me, can we come over to your house tomorrow night? <laughs> I must have had a look of surprise on my face, as she then followed up with, we'll bring pizza. <laughs> I said yes, and there began our friendship. Kelly and I, along with our husbands, then began to create a life for ourselves in this small, remote community. We started a book club, of course. <laughs> we started a dinner club. We sought out others we could connect with. We used to joke when we met someone interesting that we had to get them before someone else did. <laughs> Kelly actually befriended a woman in the grocery store once because she was wearing a nursing shirt. <laughs> I used to think of Kelly as aggressively social. <laughs> it took me a while to realize she was aggressively loving. And what love? There aren't enough superlatives. My husband Mike recently observed what a gift it was to witness daily life with Jean and Kelly and the kids when they were small. We shared all of the typical family traditions with them. Pumpkin carving and Halloween, egg hunts at Easter, Thanksgiving meals, 
an annual tacky tinsel tour at Christmas. And more. As I looked through old photos in the last few weeks, I was struck by how many moments we shared together and how Kelly and Jean opened up their life to us. And also, how many of these traditions we now share with our own children and fondly recall doing these same things with Daisy, Lucy, and Henry. Someone said, there are friends and there is family. And then there are friends that become family. Kelly and Jean came back for us and many others during our time in Oklahoma. <coughs> Kelly had a way of gathering people around her and making us all the better for being in her orbit. She was so open, so inviting. I was in awe of how she could manage a family, a career, and this growing network of friends. She was constantly doing something for someone else, making and dropping off a meal, sharing a special gift just because, showing up unexpectedly just when you needed. One time I was in the hospital following surgery, and I had had a miserable night. Kelly strode in first thing in the morning and began to massage my feet. I was so happy to see her. I burst into tears at the sight of her. When Henry was born, Kelly Jean asked us to be his godparents. And it was so important to us, because we knew it was in part to keep us connected as we realized our lives would eventually separate us geographically. <coughs> but Kelly never let that geography separate us much. Every person here has experienced Kelly's gift of staying in touch with a huge network of friends. As I look back on our 19 years of friendship, I realize no other friend in my life has had a greater influence. Kelly taught me how to be a closer friend, a better parent, and a stronger woman. How I can do it all well and with joy. Kelly brought so much joy and laughter to my life and to the lives of all she gathered around her. I've been communicating in these last few weeks with some of our Stillwater friends sharing stories about Kelly. There was one story that was so special, I wanted to share it here with you. This comes from our friend, Kate Helgren. I guess knowing Kelly means having a special story about her. I was one of the Stillwater Book Club members. 15 years, two states, and three book clubs later, I reflect back on how exceptionally wonderful that group of women was. And knowing Kelly, I have a story too. My story is for Henry. <coughs> Henry, your mom asked me to photograph your birth. <laughs> world and experience your parents' grace for the very first time. Your mom was incredible. From the moment I arrived, she was calm and prepared for the task at hand. The lights were low, the setting peaceful, her trust in your dad's coaching, her doula's expertise, and her own body was clear. She was so focused, so confident, through the brute force and gentle breath of her love, you began your life, your journey. Henry, your birth was extraordinary. She said your mother. And just like you, your mom's love was me. Dad, I hope you do forever. You, your family, and all of Kelly's beloveds, hold her essence in your beings. Tap that essence and love, laugh, and live with abundance. 
he words and she is Because 
Both she and sunflowers are brilliant, bold, sassy, and filled with light. I think of dancing and starlight and yoga poses. I think of long walks, deep talks, and horse dreams. While I haven't fully grasped the reality of Kelly's passing, I certainly feel her light inside of me. Like the petals of the sunflower, her life, compassion, and generosity are alive in each of us. I was telling another friend of Kelly's untimely death, and she reminded me that Mendelssohn died at the age of 31. And it's not how long you live, but what you do with that life. Kelly lived large. She lived beautifully. She lived brilliantly, brightly. Now it's up to us to go forward and fulfill Kelly Ward's powerful legacy to be better colleagues, better friends, citizens, parents, aunties, and to continually strive to be better people. Let us go and dance among the sunflowers and stars. We love you, Kelly. Well, what an honor to be here. So many friends, great family, and all the, uh, all the people that were meeting. Kelly made such an impact on him. Kelly and I go back a long ways. We were uh, students at the University of Montana together. I was a musician in a punk rock new wave band. <laughs> and, uh, I knew her then, and, and uh, you know, she, since uh, Susanna, I've known her through the horse world and, and music world. You know, we, we were uh, on a band, a musician, and it's kind of taken a different route. We've kind of skewed the the pop music route of selling millions of albums, and we sing music that celebrates the Western lifestyle, this great Western culture that we live in. And uh, you know, it's we don't have a lot of fans, but Gene and Kelly were always wonderful fans. <laughs> they, they always made it seem like I made the right decision of just doing music that we wanted to do, and, and it's, uh, they don't know how much it means to, to have them as fans. And, Anyway, um, when not on singing music, um, I come from a family of horsemen. We raised quarter horses, and we were involved in Kelly's horse world. I think we sold her her first performance horse, Levi, which was a, a horse that was going to be a cutting horse. He had an injury, kind of took him out of the, uh, the cutting scene. So, but he was a 40-year-old at the time, and we knew Kelly was looking for a good horse. And I told Kelly, Kelly was just starting to get in the perform, performance horse aspect, um, which is, you know, very competitive and tough. Um, and I said, you can go two routes. We have Levi, a four-year-old. He's that's kind of like a teenage horse. You know, they really don't know everything yet. But I said, you can buy a nice older horse that knows everything that will take care of you. So you have the challenge route or a sure thing route. Well, you know Kelly's choice. She, she wanted the young horse. And, uh, so I have a song that uh, kind of reminds me of Levi, her first horse that I know she had a lot of struggles with, but if you're not struggling to horse the ship, you're, you're not doing anything. Yeah. Oh, there's nothing like a good one between your knees, like to the reins and women to please. Together is one, the day will be done. On a good one, I'll find my way home. All the world looks better from up on the throne, strapped to the outside of muscle. On a good one, I'll find my way home. Where luck is thick and the days are long, danger is quick and the cattle are strong. Mary in movement, purpose, and song. On a good one, find my way home. When it 
glassy angels <coughs> call out my name. And the world is ended on this earthly plane. Send me away on a big, honest bay. On a good one, I find my way home. Yes, on a good one. I'll find my way Planning, 
all of our all important weekends. One particular high school memory was a Friday night. We were going to a party and I was picking Kelly up. I called her right before I left my house in West Cape May. She told me to hurry up. <laughs> she told me I always took too long to get to her house the weekend before. <laughs> always being the encouraging friend, she said to me, you took so long last week, tonight I'll time you. <laughs> and me, always wanting to please Kelly, accepted the challenge. I hung up the phone, ran down the stairs, flew out the door, jumped into my parents' red Nova. I flew up the Garden State Parkway to where Kelly's house in Cape May Courthouse. I sped up her long driveway, screeched to a dramatic stop in front of her house, and jumped out of the car, so proud of myself. I knew I had to have beaten my previous time, which was about 15 minutes. There stood Kelly with a watch in her hand. <laughs> Seven minutes, she said. You'll do better next time. <laughs> it was during the high school years that the eight of us started our pyramid pictures. There are countless pictures of us at simple get-togethers, reunions, even some of our weddings, pile on top of each other, having the time of our lives. Winters in Cape May County were interesting. Being a tourist town, most businesses closed up after Labor Day. The weekends during the school year were either school dances, the movies, or house parties. During the long, cold winters, we would keep an eye on the weather and look forward to snowstorms. School would be canceled even when a small amount of snow would fall. Because several of us girls lived offshore, we would always make it our job to get in, get snowed in at Susan Albino's house. <laughs> she lived in a big old house on the bay in Wild Crest. The beauty of that was that the first sign of snow, her parents would head right to the Poconos to skate. Perfect scenario, right? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> a whole bunch of us pack our bags for a few days and gather at Susan's. There was one time that we were there, we were making prank phone calls. <laughs> Thankfully, it was pre caller ID. We were very original. We would call random numbers and ask if the refrigerator was mine. <laughs> when they answered yes, we would suggest they go catch it. One day we woke up really early to listen to the radio, which was how we found out if school was canceled or not. We were so disappointed that Wild Catholic High School was not one of the cancellations on the list being read. Finally, we decided to just take matters into our own hands and call the convent directly to find out if school was canceled. We all gathered around the phone and I dialed the number. When Sister Marion answered, I gravely asked her, is school canceled today? She was furious. Who is this? She asked me. I gave her the name of someone else in the school and hung up the phone. <laughs> when we got to school, Mr. Platt came up to a couple of us and said, the nuns are really pissed that you guys called the convent this morning. He was laughing, and of course we panicked. We didn't call the convent this morning, like we all said. Mr. Platt looked right at us and said, give it up, girl. She clearly heard Kelly laughing in the back. <laughs> Summer of 1981 was a great summer. The legal drinking age was 18 at the time, which in hindsight is horrifyingly young. But we took full advantage of it and partied it up all summer. Unfortunately for me, that was the summer that several bars had mechanical bulls in them. <laughs> Nothing made Kelly happy, happier than me getting a couple drinks and me agreeing to buy the mechanical bull. I lived, lived to make Kelly laugh, and this certainly brought about her laughter. As the summer came to an end and everyone was getting ready to go their separate ways in the fall, I had a going away party in my parents' garage apartment. There were five or six of us girls with beer, music, and lots of laughter. At around 2.30 a.m., someone suggested we walk to the restaurant that was open 24 hours and have breakfast. As we were changing from our pajamas to street clothes, Kelly had a great idea. Wouldn't it be funny if we put our clothes on backwards <laughs> and walk to breakfast? Oh my god, yes, of course, that's a great idea. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of us complied, but I know I did. Somewhere, there's a picture of me with my clothes on backwards, and Kelly looking on, laughing her ass off, with all of her clothes on perfectly normal. <laughs> Next came the college years. Kelly's first college was Westchester University, which was conveniently located roughly two hours from home. I didn't go to college, and Kelly wasn't happy about that, but I visited her many, Many, many times. I visited her so often that I thought I had earned an honorary diploma. <laughs> Kelly always came home for the holidays and the summers, and we couldn't wait to reunite. We would pick names out of a hat for Pollyanna gift exchange over the Thanksgiving break, and then meet over Christmas break to exchange the gifts. We were exceptionally blessed to remain so close over the years. The years passed by. We all married and had kids, but we all made sure we saw each other as often as possible. Kelly was certainly the glue that kept all of us together. 
She was also our historian, always making sure plenty of pictures were taken. 2003 was the year the girls and I turned 40. We wanted to go away to commemorate it. Kelly, Kate, Peachy, Susan, and I headed to Dewey Beach, Delaware for a three-night getaway. Our plan was just to chill at the pool and on the beach during the day and roam around for dinner and shop at night. On the morning of day three, I was brushing my teeth when I saw it. Kate's black two-piece string bikini hanging in the back of the bathroom door. I'm usually always up to get a laugh from my girls, but this one was risky. I knew the girls were in the living room on the other side of the bathroom door just hanging out and drinking coffee. But I also knew Kelly was never far from her camera. <laughs> Finally, I figured, what the hell? I squished this old girl into that two-piece <laughs> black string, string bikini. I took a deep breath. I opened the bathroom door and asked, hey, you girls ready for the beach? <laughs> they all turned around at once, and I got the reaction I was aiming for. As expected, in the midst of her howling laughter, Kelly yelled, somebody hold her down, where's my camera? <laughs> I had purposely kept my hand on the door knob to the bathroom so I could make a clean dash back into that bathroom before there was photo evidence of this event. Thank God I was successful and saved it back behind the locked door of the bathroom just in time. I knew Kelly had a habit of sending pictures of different occasions through the mail with postcards. She would simply take the picture, turn it over, write a little note, the person's name, an address, pop a stamp on it and mail it. There were many mail carriers over the years who would look at us with a smile or a puzzle on their face. <laughs> Every single time we went away after that, one of us always reminded Kate to bring that infamous black two-piece strength of people. I had the opportunity to meet Kelly in different cities every once in a while. A few years ago, we met in New Orleans. We all know how much Kelly likes to walk, and New Orleans is a great city to do just that. Kelly had a meeting one day, and before she left, she made it clear that my job was to find a great place for dinner. She had reached out to a friend before we left and asked for some reservation suggestions, uh, restaurant suggestions. He had recommended an Instagram page that was focused solely on food in New Orleans. Between the Instagram page and TripAdvisor, I did my research and I decided that dinner that night was going to be at a restaurant named Luke. I made a reservation for 7 o'clock and went about my day. We met back in the room, and I told Kelly where we were eating and the address. Kelly smiled, one of her huge smiles, and said, I know right where that is, which was good news for me because I have zero sense of direction. At around 5.30, <laughs> Kelly suggested we head to dinner. My feet hurt already. After walking close to an hour, I said to her, are we close to the restaurant? She smiled at me with a little giggle and answered, almost there. We get to Luke's and have a great dinner and a lot of fun. As dinner came to a, clue, a close, I was preparing my feet for the long walk back to the hotel. We headed out of the restaurant with Kelly and taking the lead. After about 45 minutes, I say to her, is the hotel close? Pretty close, she answered. We finally get back to the hotel and my feet and I sleep like a baby. The next morning, we're up bright and early. As we headed out of the hotel, I glance across the street and I see a building with a sign above the door that reads, Luke's. <laughs>
big catchphrase that whole trip and during phone calls and every time we had a get together after that. <laughs> Kelly always said I, was being, I should be on stage. She was my greatest audience. It was on this trip that we learned our good friend Susan Alamino how to beat the ladder. <laughs> the first night there, we went to a street fair. As we were leaving, with Susan leading the way back to the car, we realized we were following wet spots on the ground. <laughs> Susan, Kelly Howe, are you pissing yourself? <laughs> we all lost our minds laughing, including Susan. I have a weak bladder, Susan. <laughs> My doctor gave me medicine for it. It was then that Kelly suggested that Susan find a new doctor. <laughs> for the remainder of the trip, we could not stop talking about this. When we got to the airport for our return flight, we were sitting around the table having lunch laughing while reminiscing the highlights of our trip, which we all agreed was Susan pissing her pants. <laughs> Ironically, that number one highlight was usurped when Susan jumped up and tried to make it to the bathroom. She was unsuccessful. And sure enough, while leaning against the pillar, right by the monorail of the Orlando International Airport, surrounded by people rushing to catch their flights, Susan delivered an encore performance. <laughs> That, my friends, was the hardest I had ever seen Kelly laugh in the 45 plus years of the world. <laughs> Kelly was our adventurous friend. On June 21st, I got a random text from her. We need to go to Rome, just past the gate. It's a direct flight from Philly. <laughs> Kelly, my fun, sassy, funny, brilliant, happy, adventurous, thoughtful, kind friend. I simply can't remember a time in my life when you weren't in it. I love you. And I will miss you every day for the rest of my life. I'm here all week. Try to be. We're going to take it in a little bit different direction. Here. <laughs> so, uh, I told you earlier, G and Kelly are, were big, are big fans of our music, and uh, it was always wonderful to see them on the dance floor, and they came to practically every show that we've done around here. Uh, it's just wonderful to have fans. But I always remember them on the dance floor. And this song was a song that Kelly uh, requested every time uh, we were on stage. Yes. 
stop again. Sweet bird of you, the easy keeper, fly with the season. I'll do.
there's a lot of stories to tell. I told Rose she had no uh, no limits on what she could say or how hard she could say. <laughs> so if the censors have any questions, they can they can uh, penalize me. I'd also like to thank Lucy for getting us started tonight. That was that was a tough step, tough place to step into. Um, I'd like to thank Wiley, who's been really important to us for a long time since we've gotten the blues. His music is really special to my family, and I think you see why. And I'd also like to thank Magnolia Emerson, birthday child, and a mom, Becky. Um, I put them up to this. <laughs> Kelly was hoping to have Magnolia play at her birthday party. I decided as part of this, it'd be wonderful if we could have everybody up on stage. They rehearsed for the first time yesterday, I think. Um, and I'm not sure any of them knew the song a week ago when I asked them. It, but it was wonderful and it's very special. Um, I don't have to stop doing thank yous in a moment, but I want to thank all the people of Pullman, this community that's been a wonderful support to us. Um, and I'm going to miss a bunch of people, but the Pullman meal train, remember that's been set up, people have been delivering food to my family. It's been wonderful. Um, South Fork and Black Cypress, I understand, have contributed to our next event. Um, there have been cards, there's been assistance, there have been messages. Just a wonderful outpouring of support. And so I want to thank everybody who's here and everybody who sent regards. And I want to mention, for those of you who were early arrivers, guess what is over there? We, uh, we left it at home. And so the first two thirds of the people who came in didn't get a chance to sign it. And then I kicked some other people out of line because we want to get started. I suspect that a lot of this was easier to write, even though it wasn't easy to write, than it will be to deliver. Bear with me. I'll start with a note, and I wrote this down because I knew that extemporaneous this would get tricky. I'll start with a note I received yesterday. Kelly was part of a long standing journal project with a number of women. Multiple journals were circulating at once. Fill a few pages, mail to the next person, receive one from the person before you. Tracy Lomax shared this. The prompt is What do I like about myself? I like being giving. I like being playful. I like helping people. I like that I can help people formulate ideas. I like my sense of adventure. I like my hair right now. A new cut that I think is sassy. I like my cowgirl side. Kelly's passing leaves us with much to mourn, but also much to remember, and much to treasure, and much work to do. I feel a great loss for the WSU community because Kelly had accomplished so much in her one short year as Vice Provost, and she had energy and plans and momentum to continue. It has warmed my heart to hear Dan Bernardo and Leanne Hunter and others speak to Kelly's impact and legacy on campus. And I hope their example continues to animate the campus and its faculty and staff. Provost Bernardo's concept of a fund to perpetuate Kelly's legacy on campus was exactly the right idea at a moment when I had no thoughts at all. It meant a lot to me. Kelly has other legacies too. <clears throat> the friendships and relationships she created and fostered and honored, reaching out, visiting, writing, taking pictures, the students and colleagues she challenged and inspired, the broken souls she stood by while they found their way back to wholeness, the families and communities she helped to tie together, and our family, our children, so smart, strong, adventurous, and steady. Daisy, Lucy, and Henry are very special people and a tribute to their mother. They and I will need your help in the times ahead. I'm a very lucky man. I met Kelly 30 years ago and spent 27 years at her side, more than half my life. We had a good run, and we knew it. Each day, I said a little prayer of gratitude that she picked me. This is a party Kelly spent her whole life on. The guest list was 55 years in the making. Kelly loved to bring people together from all points on the compass and watch connections form and stories flow. Please don't let this moment slip away. Join us at the reception, smile for the cameras, because, of course, there will be pictures. 
The way we build the holes left by Kelly's departure will be by reaching across the gaps. I've been thinking a lot this month about a Kurt Vonnegut concept that I misremembered from 30 years ago. <laughs> I was invited to a, a party outside of Missoula, and I obviously forgot what was in the party invitation. But in my mind, it was a Kurt Vonnegut concept, and um, I'm going to use my concept, I'll use his word. His word was called Karas, comes from Cat's Cradle. But I define that as the circle of people throughout your life with whom you have meaningful relationship. Kelly's circle of meaningful relationships is the largest that I know, and larger even than I knew. These last few weeks, I have found out about so many people that she touched. Each day, I hear new stories about her generosity and kindness. On a walk yesterday, walking up the Magpie Forest, you know where that is, I thought about caress, and I thought about lists. If you ask people to name their 10 best friends, their five best friends, their two best friends, their very best friend, Kelly would appear on more of those lists than anyone I know. If you ask, who called you the most? Who sent the most postcards or letters? Who were your favorite or best remembered advisors, colleagues, or mentors? Who noticed when things went right in life? Kelly's on all of those lists too. If you ask, who stood by while you were down, or struggling, or lost? Who walked you through a breakup or lost job? Whose presence always made a bad day better? Kelly's on that list, too. And if you ask, who do you miss the most? She's on that list, too. She didn't expect that. <laughs> I promise you. So here's a quote from Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Kelly made us feel important, special, empowered, able, heard, understood, worthy, and loved. That's Kelly's legacy. Let's keep that feeling alive. We've got one more song for you, and then please join us at the reception of the Alumni Center, which is just right down the road. Thank you.